Uh, thank you very much, Punyamala, for that very kind, very generous uh, introduction. Sisters and brothers, fellow lovers. The coming of love is mysterious as the flight of a bird from unknown lands. It's going mysterious as the unseen tumult of the wind blowing we know not whither. What is this mystery of love that has opened in my heart like a bud at midnight and sends its sweetness crying through the dark like the voice of one mad with desire? Strange it is, strange indeed, that shooting up through the crevices of my heart unfolds itself ever whiter and whiter the pale green lily of love. If the flower of love blooms not within the garden of my heart, with what shall I come in my hands to worship thee, O Lord? Bring flowers, bring lights, bring incense, O fools that do not know the holiness of love. So that's Sangharachita. Bante, the opening of his long poem, The Veil vale of Stars, written in Kalimpong between 1950 and 1953. And the nature of the poem, of course, as you probably all know, charts the sort of movement, the transformation of desire, what, as he puts it later on in the poem, desire for anybody, as it flowers as love for someone, and fruits as compassion for all sentient beings. It's a poem very heavily under the influence of Rabindranath Tagore, especially his uh, collection Stray Birds. Uh, but also you can see throughout that poem uh, the influence of Platonism. Uh, it's a Platonic poem, a Buddhist Platonic poem. Around the same time, Bhante wrote an essay for uh, uh, Stepping Stones, uh, an, an editorial called The Good Friend, which is a really magnificent article. And all those years ago, and I think the insight was even before this particular essay, he talked about the importance of finding emotional equivalents for intellectual understanding. I think around that time he was saying, which he has reiterated so many times, the central problem of the spiritual life for most people is to find emotional equivalents for intellectual understanding. We know everything. We know everything. But we do not embody that emotionally. And in that essay on the good friend, he talks especially about friendship, spiritual friendship on all its levels, being the emotional equivalent of the doctrine of an Atman. If you want to live an Atman, you practice love, you practice friendship, which he describes as selfless service to your friends. One of the reasons why I'm a disciple of Sangharakshita is, is because of his emphasis on emotion, his emphasis on the transformation of desire, his recognition that we are creatures of desire. We are creatures of emotion. We are driven by desire. We make decisions out of desire. That needs to be engaged fully in our Dharma life. It needs to be transformed. Otherwise, there is no Dharma life. What or who do we love? Where is our life, our love? If we can't identify that, if we can't recognize that, and if that love isn't coming into our Dharma life, there is no Dharma life. As he says, bring flowers, bring lights, bring incense, O oh, fools who do not know the holiness of love, as if to say, well, you can have all the puja in the world, you can have all the religious observance in the world, you can be a good Buddhist, with all the good ideas of a good Buddhist, a good 
dharmachari, a good dharmacharini. But without love, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. With love, yes, there is just outward religious observance. It's, it's very worthy, it's very good, but if we're not careful, we end up with what Bhante called in one seminar many years ago, the spectre of Buddhism. The spectre of Buddhism. He was commenting on, uh, in the White Lotus Sutra, you get this expression, the anti-dharma. The anti-dharma, almost like the antichrist, isn't it? The anti-dharma, whoa, the anti-dharma. <laughs> And he said that he thought that the anti-dharma was the spectre of Buddhism. And he said that the, he meant spectre in the Blakeian sense. The alienated intellect. Buddhism, the dharma leached of all emotion, all imagination, all life. So this, of course, is a talk about love. And I hope I will address, uh, at least implicitly, the themes of the weekend. What is it? Karma Niyama in the service of the Dharma Niyama, intensity and ethical standards. Uh, I hope they'll be addressed. I'm going to talk about my subject of love under five headings. Love for the Buddha, love for others, love and knowing, love and death, and finally the flashing forth of the all-maturing cosmogonic eros. And lots of glasses of water on the way. <laughs> Love for the Buddha, first of all. Call forth as much as you can of love, of reverence and of faith. This is the opening lines of the Ratnaguna Sanchaya Gata Pragnaparamita. And I just want to concentrate on that word love. Love. The word is prema. Prema. Para prema gaurava prasada. Para prema gaurava prasada. Prema. Uh, love. Devotion. It's a very strong word, this word. Prema. And of course we usually associate it with something kind of slightly unskillful as it's the near enemy of metta, isn't it? It's attached love. Prema. Prema. Uh, but here it's described as something entirely positive, entirely positive. And one wonders if, if even the transmitters of the tradition are using a word that's much more, as it were, in the vernacular, something much more, in a way, human that would really touch people. You need to love the Buddha. You need to have a strong, one-pointed, attached love to the Buddha, even a kind of obsessive love for the Buddha. I remember, I think, Bhante standing here uh, some time ago gave a talk on uh, reflections on going forth and he talked about the Arya Pariyasana and he picked up on the fact that the word asana means desire and he even talked about having a kind of mania for the Dharma life, a mania for the Dharma life. Of course, he'd say it in that very kind of calm, casual no frills sort of way, like not like I speak, you know, and you can miss it. But Bhante uses his words carefully, a mania for the Dharma. So love, love comes before reverence, it comes before faith, it comes before prasada in this list. Para prema gaurava prasada. The Buddha is our first love, needs to be our first love. I remember years ago, as if to kind of make this point to me, just after my ordination, Bhante sent me a postcard. And in those days, postcards from Bhante were sort of scrutinised for their hidden meanings. Um, the very, very, you know, you've got a card from Bhante, the picture, the name of it, it's got a really, it's a teaching. You know, that was it. And I think this one was. It was a painting by Magritte, a reproduction of a painting by Magritte of a blue sky with a golden apple, a blue apple, and a red apple floating in that blue sky. And the title of the painting was First Love. First Love, as if to say the three jewels, Padmavadra, are now your first love. They become before all other loves. We've been having this... Um, discussion, have we? I don't know if we have. But there's all this stuff about imagining, reimagining the Buddha. <laughs> imagining the Buddha, reimagining the Buddha can only come from love. 
You can't imagine anything without love. That's just not, imp that's just not possible. When you have a strong desire for someone, for something, you image it effortlessly. There's this sort of weird idea that people can't visualize and stuff like that. Well, tell me that when you've come out of a meditation where you've been having a kind of virulent sexual fantasy. You're seeing, tasting, tasting? Uh, <laughs> feeling everything. So don't tell me that you can't visualize. It's, it's it, you know, what, what, what you imagine is what you desire. We image our desires, our desires embody in our minds. So we need to find the Buddha in the most beautiful, enchanting and fascinating and compelling of forms. And perhaps before we even think about the Buddha, we need to look at our experience and discover what are indeed the beautiful, enchanting, fascinating and compelling of forms. Who are they? What is it? That's what we've got to do first of all. There's a great hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, a very important one, endlessly meditated upon by the Sufi mystics. I have seen my Lord in the most beautiful of forms. I have seen my Lord in the most beautiful of forms. The imageless, the unbounded, the dimensionless always clothes itself in the most beautiful, in the most fascinating, in the most enchanting for you and for me. Only that can tease us out of thought, can tease us into an experience of the imageless, the dimensionless, the boundless, that which is beyond dimension. It needs to come as beauty. That's actually the nature of sadhana. <laughs> Medita the meditation that we get introduced to, the sadhana that we get introduced to at uh, ordination, that's not another meditation practice. That's not another method or technique or anything like that. That's not what's going on there. What you're being introduced to is the explosion of shunyata. The explosion of shunyata, the way shunyata clothes itself, crystallizes itself for you. And of course that will inevitably change and morph and be fluid because you're moving into a fluid dimension and the icons, the images, the stories, the myths are pointers to that dimension, to that significance. There's a very mysterious passage in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta it's one of the conversations going on between the Buddha and Ananda. And Bhante's actually done a wonderful lecture on this called The Disappearing Buddha. It's a very mysterious conversation where the Buddha speaks about eight assemblies, warriors, Brahmins, summoners, householders, various kinds of gods. And the Buddha says to Ananda, I remember hundreds of these assemblies. I've attended hundreds of these assemblies. And before I sat with them and joined in their conversation, the beings in these assemblies, I adopted their appearance, which I take to mean he took their clothes, their look, and I adopted their speech, whatever that might be. So if he's with warriors, he becomes a warrior. If he's with gods, he becomes a god, and so on. And I sat with them and instructed and inspired and fired and delighted them with the Dharma. And they did not know me and wondered, who is that like this? Is he a deva or is he a man? Having instructed them, I disappeared and still they did not know. He has just disappeared. Was he a deva or a man? That's the end of the conversation. The Buddha clothes himself always in what will reach us, what will teach us, what will communicate with us, what will converse with us. Sadhana is really actually an intimate conversation, an intimate conversation with the, with the Buddha seen in the most beautiful and meaningful of forms for you. That's what's really going on in that. 
if you want to have a kind of insight into what that might be like, I'd suggest looking at Bante's meditation diaries, just the extract from, that he includes in, uh, in The Sign of the Golden Wheel in the section on Nature Cure Clinic uh, Retreat. Just these brilliant little insights into his meditation where he's receiving advice from a deeper dimension, intimate conversation. Of course, such intimate conversations with the Buddha in the form that is most beautiful to us requires a selflessness on our part, requires a welcome, a courtesy. We talk about selflessness and that sort of thing, but that needs to be expressed in very, very human qualities, very, very human behaviours, like welcome, like courtesy, like manners, like uh, hospitality, where you put the other before you fully and completely. You forget yourself entirely. Uh, you create an atmosphere that will please and delight the guest, this stranger. And I think actually that's the real meaning of puja. That's what puja should really begin with. Puja is really a training in selflessness. When we do puja, we need to imagine what would really please the Buddha. What would really please the guest. Not what you think will please them. Not what you want to express. But what would really please them. What will enable the guest to feel so pleased, so delighted that he or she would want to please you, would want to delight you. When I lived in India, I experienced this many, many times. And I remember vividly one day, I was sick. I had a very high fever, as happens in India. I was living in Bombay at the time. And we'd arranged, as we, as we did in those days, we did lots of Dharma talks all over Bombay. And Bodhi Sen had arranged a Dharma talk in a new area, a new area. It was a non-Buddhist sweeper, municipal sweeper colony in uh, Bombay Central. And I just thought, I can't go, I'm too ill. And Bodhi Sen came round and said, let's, let's go. And I said, I can't, I'm too ill. And his face fell so heavily, I said, okay, we'll go. Um, <laughs> but we got, we're not going by bus, we're not going on rush hour bus to this thing. I can't do it, I'll die. Uh, we'll go by taxi. Yes, and you don't do anything, you just sit there. You just sit, I'll give the talk, but we go. So we went. And these people, these very, very poor people, not Buddhist people, they'd cleaned their area. They set up this fabulous shrine. There were garlands and flowers everywhere, and there was such a courtesy and welcome and uh, a sense of being honoured. I thought, I'll have to say a few words. I can't not give. I can't not respond here. It would be evil. It would be sinful not to. And of course, you get up, people respond, you go on, and you go on, and you go on. Yes, go on and on. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's great. You know, I have to recommend, if you're really sick, give a Dharma talk. Um, especially if you've got a fever, because you get into some incredibly sort of trippy spaces. You get, you get sort of ecstatic, completely out of yourself. It's a bit like being on something. Um, but yes, it, it, it was this experience of something being drawn out in me because of the love of these people their courtesy. They didn't know me. They didn't know who I was. But there was this natural human puja. And that taught me something about what really needs to go on in puja in relation to the Buddha. Imagining what would please the Buddha. Anyway, I think this brings us on to uh, love uh, for others. Uh, love for uh, for all others, on all occasions, because that's what we are asked to do by the Buddha. Love for others, all others, on all occasions. The demand of love 
is to place others before us as we would place the Buddha before us. Dr. Ambedkar in The Buddha and His Dhamma, in a passage which Bhante regards as some of Baba Seb's deepest thinking, describes the Dhamma as morality and morality as the Dhamma. And by morality, he means love. By morality, he means placing another and all others before you and treating them with the respect that all others need and deserve. Uh, because we all, of course, want to feel uh, respected. We all want to be, feel that we are appreciated. We all want to feel treated with kindness. We want to feel safe and protected. So Baba Seb says, yes, you do that with every, everybody. And he says, this morality is sacred. It's sacred. It's more sacred than any pilgrimage. It's more sacred than any shrine. The necessity to respect others in love, all others. And it's universal. It's not partial. It's for everywhere, on all occasions. Being fully present, fully attuned in all assemblies, as the Buddha says he was, so that there becomes then loving service. Again, a welcoming, a hospitality to every person that you meet, a courtesy to all who we meet. Shantideva's Bodhicharya Avatara is full of the language of service. Service to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, service to the Bodhicitta, service to living beings. They're actually the same thing for Shantideva. They're the same thing. There's no distinction. It's the same love, actually. If we fail in love for others, we fail in love for the Buddhas. We fail in love for the Dharma. <laughs> and again, some interesting India experiences. I don't know why it's often Indian experiences that come up. I had kind of a couple of experiences of the sort of partiality of my love. There was one retreat um, that we had, an ordination retreat that Bhante, and Bhante had done the ordinations. And after the ordinations, I was sort of, I was the guard on Bhante's door because there were loads of people in our little retreat centre in Baja and they were all kind of milling around and people were a bit concerned that people might just sort of wander into Bhante's room and, you know, Bhante needed a bit of a rest. He wasn't that well. He'd just done a load of ordinations and all the rest of it. So I was guarding the door. And as often happens, people were very excitable and there were lots of children and they were making a lot of noise while Bhante was trying to rest. So I found myself in this situation where I'd go in and check on Bhante and say, hey, Bhante, everything all right? You okay? Can I get you anything? And, and then I'd go out and say, hey, shut up, be quiet, go, go, bust, you know, and all the rest of it. And this kind of went on in this way. And I suddenly almost got it wrong that I went into Bhante and said, be quiet. So, so definite partiality there. Another occasion, a very, a very tender moment with Bhante, again in India, was, um, and again, the sort of partiality of, of, of my love, the exclusiveness of it, of it, if you like. We'd have these, when we were first, the first time Bhante came to India after we'd started things, Bhante gave these fantastic lectures in the, you know, to thousands of people. I'd never seen anything like it. And again, I was Bhante's sort of um, uh, kind of attendant, I suppose. So after the lecture, it was gathering up the garlands, finding his sandals, kind of putting them on his feet, and then, you know, pushing through the crowd to get to the car that would take us back home. And, you know, people, especially older people, um, wanted, um, especially poor people, wanted to come to Bhante and touch his feet um, and touch him. And I was very concerned that this was hassling Bhante. So I was trying, I was just pushing people out the way. And this very kindly but firm hand was placed on my shoulder uh, by Bante, Bante's hand. And he said, no, you mustn't do that. It's very important for people. With such uh, tenderness and compassion. And I learned something, that this receipt of um, respect wasn't about him. It was about them and their sense of connection. And again, I was shown my 
limitations. Now, in a way, it's easy to talk about loving everybody, all beings, all humans. Um, you know, we can sometimes see, if we look out at the end of a metabarvna, the, the sort of smiling faces and so on, you know, as we feel, you know, perhaps we even do it ourselves, we can get off on feeling love for the generality of humanity, of beings. But Buddhist tradition is very clear about taking that and testing that into the most difficult of situations and places. That's why I, I, I still, sorry to say this after all these years, been doing the metabhavna since I was 17. Um, I still do the five-stage metabhavna. Issues, I've still got issues, you know. Third-stage people, fourth-stage people, sorry about that, I hope it doesn't undermine you, but that's the reality. Uh, and I think the five-stage metabhavna is really important because it shows the limits of yourself. It shows the limits of your self-view and your selfishness. And it's very interesting when you look at Shantideva in his amazingly profound discussion of uh, meditation in the Bodhicharavatara, where he talks about the pari, para, 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 Paratma Parivarsana, Paratma para, Parivarsana, the magical exchange of self and other, where you use the shunyata reflection to identify with all others, to become the other, as it were. But who does he choose? Who does he choose? Who does he select to exchange with? He doesn't talk about his friends, his mates, and things like that. He talks about an inferior in the, in, in the monastic community who resents him. That's who he exchanges with. He exchanges with a rival, a rival for patronage, a kind of peer. And he exchanges with a superior who looks down on him and bosses him around. Apart from anything, it's quite an insight into the state of Nalanda in the, in the 8th century. But it's incredible. You know, he, he, he encourages this exchange with the most difficult, problematic of people. And the exchange involves not only kind of being with them and identifying with them, but looking back at himself from their perspective and giving himself a good going over, a good cr criticism. I, I don't do this practice myself, just to say, but I think it sounds great, but I mean, I'm not ready for that. But in a way, you don't need it, do you? It's hard enough. Um, it's hard enough on a kind of much lower level. But this is, I think, also one of the most beautiful things about Sangha, about spiritual community and an order such as ours. It's a real training in love for others, for the real other, the real other, which is the enemy. That's the real other because they really are so other. The difficult person, the person that really gets up your nose, that sets your teeth on edge. And who most annoyingly, you can't get away from. There's a beautiful thing about the Sangha, totally infuriating. There are people you can end up with a chapter with, in a chapter with, and you think, I don't, how, how? <laughs> how, how has this happened? How, how did I arrange my life in, in this way? And living with them, you know, living next door to them, how, what's happened? And as Banti said, you know, years ago in a very early lecture, um, meaning of spiritual community, he said, well, you can hardly ask them to leave the Sangha, can you? You can hardly do that because you don't like them. It doesn't sound too good. And you're not going to leave, are you? So you're left with the work of loving. And he talks about mutual modification of being. These, these things are trainings in selflessness. They're training in overcoming our egotism. And oh, it's hard. I mean, I'm not setting myself up here. I do, do want to be completely honest. I find this incredibly difficult, this area, I have to say. Sorry again to, to have to admit this, but I mean, it is true. So I'm not setting myself up and giving you all a telling off. I'm talking to myself here. Um, and Buddhist tradition says there's absolutely no excuse for not loving. Again, it's another beautiful and irritating thing about the Buddha. 
Um, because, you know, you sometimes have conversations. You even do the conversations in your own mind. Maybe even say them. I'll love them if they apologise. When they confess their faults, I'll admit mine. Then I can forgive. It's really weird, you know, sometimes in the Sangha we forget our most basic Dharma teachings. It's really strange, you know, that in the sort of thick of Sangha communication, it's somehow these really basic Dharma teachings are kind of not present. It's really weird that. I've often wondered about that you know, when I do that. But let's, 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 you know, what is it? Third Dhammapada verse, right after the stuff about mind being central. Then you get those who entertain such thoughts as he or she, although it doesn't say that in the text, but I think, <laughs> I think this should definitely be an equal opportunities uh, text. Those who entertain such thoughts as he or she abused me, he or she beat me, he or she robbed me, will not still their hatred. And then you get the, the opposite. And if you, we're not stilling our hatred, we are not growing. We are not growing. It's as simple as that. And then, of course, the, 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 the great, wonderful line, uh, the, the pure Dhamma teaching, not by hatreds are hatreds ever pacified here in the world. They are only pacified by love. This is the eternal Dhamma, the eternal Dhamma, which could be translated as law, truth, reality. Not by hatreds are hatreds ever pacified here in the world. They are only pacified by love. This is the eternal Dhamma. Perhaps renouncing hatred is to serve the Dhamma Niyama. Let's go on to love and knowing. It's through others, loving others, that we come to know reality, the way things are. Love and knowledge are so often separated in, in discourse. Uh, but knowledge and wisdom and vision is found in the other. You get this very strongly in Bhante's wonderful commentary on the Ratnaguna Sanchayagata, where in talking about the perfection of wisdom, picking up on Herbert Gunther's rendering of Prajna as something like analytical appreciative discrimination, uh, Bhante focuses on, on the aesthetic, the aesthetic and the appreciative. In metta, we're aiming to see the other as they are in themselves. Through love, we see them as they are in themselves, stripped of all self-interest. He says as well, we see others as beautiful. There's a wonderful passage I found in the first uh, Tuscany um, uh, question and answer session. Ratnaguna asked a question about why it was important to do metta before sadhana, before visualization. And Bhante said, well, in metta you see everything as beautiful and you reach through metta a state of formless beauty, formless, all-pervading beauty. This is actually what the Buddha teaches. Metta leads to a, a formless liberation called the beautiful. The beautiful. And then he said, out of and he said, out of that formless beauty, the Bodhisattva, the Buddha, crystallizes. And again, he underlined the importance of beauty in, in sadhana. But when we do metta, when we have metta for others, having metta for others, we sit with them, we stand with them, and there they are in all their strangeness and wonder. And especially we see, we experience them as growing and emergent. Of course, this is what we do as order members, but it's, it's, it's what we can, we can forget, I think. Seeing others as they are, seeing them as growing, as emergent. Over the last few weeks, I've been to different centres. It's really good. I've managed to do a sort of kind of spontaneous, almost fairly spontaneous Little Dharma tour, great, great fun. London Buddhist Centre, Brighton Buddhist Centre, Nottingham Buddhist Centre. Uh, earlier this year, I was in Sheffield. I've, I've done stuff in Norwich. I went to Berlin, Essen. And of course, I do lots of retreats at Padmaloka um, with lots of men of ordination, lots of 
order members turning up, meeting lots of order members, actually. And in all these places, in one way or another, I've talked with order members about people. It's one of the major topics of conversation, and I don't mean that in a negative way either. Uh, I've talked with order members, and they tell me about men who've asked for ordination, women who've asked for ordination, mitras, friends, men and women, people coming to classes. And one of the things that's really striking, and this particularly happens when we have an order meeting on a, on a going for refuge retreat at Padmaloka, and I, I mean here not just the ordination team members, but we have a lot of order members helping us. What's so striking is the care, is the quality of attention for each individual. And the same visiting centres, the quality of care for what's going on generally in centres. I would say the quality of care is extremely high. Extremely high. Everywhere. Order members, dharmacharis, dharmacharinis. I get the, feel, I get the sense of people who are highly attuned to others as growing, emerging individuals. And it's quite obvious that there are many order members who are really intimate with people, really intimate with them, and wanting sincerely, deeply, I would say non-egotistically, the very best for those people. It's not just words, this. It's an atmosphere, an environment. You can feel it in centres. All of those centres I've been to you know, this last week, you know, I'm most aware of, London Buddhist Centre, Brighton Buddhist Centre, Nottingham Buddhist Centre, Incredible environment, you know, for people coming in, you know, from their busy lives. And there's this incredible quality of attention. There's a highly attuned awareness of others, I notice. And I think I see all the members at their very, very best when they're living for others in that way. At their really very, very best. You know, really concentrated on bringing the Dharma for others in whatever way that is in serving others. And I think order members get into difficulties when they kind of resist that, when they kind of get out of that, if you like. I think ordination is a taking of the Bodhisattva vow, um, actually. I do. I mean, we have those acceptance verses where we say the last one is, for the benefit of all beings, I accept this ordination. Well, what is that in the end? And I think if we resist that, we get into difficulties, actually. There's going to be some ethical guidelines discussions, I think, aren't there? Well, the greatest sin is to appropriate for oneself that which is utterly beyond self. Is to steal, if you like, for oneself what is the epitome of selfless generosity. As a Bodhisattva precept, that says it's a downfall to steal that which belongs to the three jewels. And I don't think we need to see that materially. It's perhaps when we resist that life of service, when we resist that. And there's a real knowing in this loving. There has to be a real knowing in this quality of loving. Because we need to know the changing states and be attuned to the changing states. The ups and downs in others, the lakshanas. In others, we need our Brahma-viharas, our love, our compassion, our sympathetic joy, our equanimity. We need that highly attuned responsiveness. Well, I, I, you know, I feel I learned so much. Uh, I, I have to make, in a way, so much effort just personally in, in meditation and study and reflection in order to be fully present and attentive to others. I've also been reflecting a bit on Amitabha's knowing of particularity, usually translated as the wisdom of discrimination, but I think, actually, if you look at the Sanskrit, the Pratya, Vekshana, Jnana, it's more like knowing particularity. And, of course, this Jnana arises with the transformation of desire. It's an utterly purified desire, an utterly purified love, an utterly purified obsession. I don't know about you, but um, when I'm in love, uh, I get very fixated with the details of the beloved. The eyebrow, the tresses, the eyes, the musky curls, 
the gait, the ruby lips, the down on the skin. These are images, by the way, from Persian love poetry. <laughs> um, which is particularly vivid. Uh, and incidentally, by the way, just on that, the real meaning of a, of a Persian ghazal by Hafiz and so on is that all this attention to the details of the beloved, all that, uh, what sounds like sort of obsession, actually all those things are theophanies. They're all showings of the divine. They're all gateways into the formless. They're all gateways into reality. Actually, all of the particulars of life are just this. So loving the unique and the particular of others, being highly attuned to them, that's what we're training in, to enable the fullest growth in them. And we need to be attuned in the moment, needing to find the exact right response, the exact right words in the moment for that person. Um, I've had some really wonderful experiences of this with Bhante. Um, so a few years ago, I went to see him in a bit of a state, um, I have to say. Another bit of a state. Um, I was, I'd lost a lot of, I'd just come back from a solitary retreat. And, you know, meditation was rubbish, um, back hurt. I was very upset because some very, very close friends of mine, you know, just seemed to be taking great chunks out of each other. And I was finding it very difficult to kind of maintain a kind of equanimity and a kind of a sameness of loving kindness for them both. And I was also deploring the lack of um, depth and insight uh, in my uh, uh, personal experience, you know, and at that time, Domerati, uh, you know, quite rightly, um, you know, the chair of the college and so on, was uh, going on, you know, we need more depth, we need much greater depth of experience. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I went to see Bunty to moan about this and <laughs> ask him for help because I thought I ought to just give up doing Dharma work and all that sort of thing and just, I don't know, in Jyoti Parler's phrase, open a tobacconist on the Edgware Road. Um, um, and you have to remember, Bunty couldn't see me properly. You know, it was, you know his, eye, his eyes were gone. And we talked about lots of things. He was extraordinarily helpful about the Dharma stuff, he said, well, wouldn't make any difference necessarily if you're giving a Dharma talk and you had insight or not, actually, because actually what people need is the Dharma. They might not know that you've got insight. What they need is the Dharma. And uh, see yourself as a medium for the Dharma. He said, that's the way I see myself. You're just a channel for it. What's important is that people connect with the Dharma, not you. That was the implicit message. Didn't say that. It's the Dharma that's important. But going a bit further, he suddenly looked at me. I mean, I don't know what he was seeing, but I really felt looked at, a kind of elephant look. And he said, you are a very, very emotional person. <laughs> and you know, nobody had ever said that to me before. <laughs> or if they had, I hadn't heard it. But when your teacher, when the man you love and revere more than anybody says, you are a very, very emotional person, you need to take that very seriously. <laughs> He's very tuned up, even though he couldn't see me, couldn't see the expression on my face. You are a very, very emotional person. So I went away and I thought, how does a very, very emotional person practice the Dharma? What does a very, very emotional person need to do? Anyway, moving on. So I would say our Dharma work entered into in this way is a wisdom practice because we have to know others in their particularity and their depth, in their ultimate depth actually, which means of course we have to go to ultimate death, depth, and that will mean death actually, that will mean our death. It will mean many deaths and the death of many things in ourselves and in our life. And the death of ourselves, yes. Spiritual death, Dharma death. So let's go to love and death. Love and death. 
My 12th century Persian Sufi peer, Sheikh Ahmad Ghazali, in his treatise on love, on Ishq, the Sawani, or the inspirations from the realm of pure spirits, speaks of love in one place as a sword, a cutting sword that cuts off even the smallest hair that faces away from the beloved, the ultimate beloved. When you invoke love, that's what you're doing. You're invoking a sword that's going to cut off everything that turns away from the divine beloved. He describes love in another place as a man-eater that eats up human nature and leaves nothing behind. He says that love is a field of destruction and that the lover is a gambler who has staked everything, who then wanders alone, destitute, a fearless pauper scorned by the world, completely undone, abject, abject indigent, a man of nothing. This may sound over the top, but I do believe that love, that the Dharma, will actually take absolutely everything. There won't just be a little modification here and there, a little dropping away. It will take, it will eat up absolutely everything. Yes, living the life of love does mean living for beauty, for enchantment, and there will be wonderful ecstatic findings. But with that comes wonderful, devastating, ecstatic losings. Now, our system of practice is becoming clearer and clearer, and the path is laid out very beautifully with the niyamas and, you know, the integration through to spontaneous compassionate activity and so on. And I have to say, my own journey just doesn't seem like that. When I think of my first encounters with the Dharma, I can only really describe them in terms of love, of falling in love with the Dharma, with being completely enchanted by the Dharma. I mean, I was 17, an adolescent, utterly naive, foolish, but I was powered by love. And that was taken seriously, which is a very beautiful thing, actually. Taken seriously, my Kalyanamitras, Buddhadasa, Visantra, took me completely seriously. I'm sure they were appalled at some of my naivety, but they kind of ignored that. There was that taking that lad seriously. And perhaps that being taken seriously was encapsulated at my ordination with Bhante on a weekend retreat with uh, Ratnaguna. And I was given everything I could wish for on that weekend, everything. I was initiated into the mantra of my Ishta Devata, my most desired and longed for Lord. And I got given that name, which is the best name ever. <laughs> and there was the beautiful Ratnaguna wearing a lovely white silk Indian shirt, very beautiful. And Banti dressed up in a fancy Tibetan shirt, high collared and his robes and his long hair and special beads from Mr. Chen. It was the summer of 76, incredibly hot. <laughs> we did the shepherd search for mind on that weekend. Banti talking about mind. You know, and it was like you were kind of getting a, yeah, a pointing out of the nature of mind. But above all else, looking back, what went on, you know, this whole, I love this word witnessing, the way we describe ordination these days, private ordination, that you're going for refuge is witnessed. Some people sort of worry it's a, it's a kind of dumbing down of what happens. Not at all. Witnessing is extraordinarily profound. To witness, to testify to someone's commitment, to someone's faith and aspiration, to someone's going for refuge is an extraordinarily profound act, actually. 
And that's what happened. I was taken completely seriously by the man I most loved and most revered, by the man I was completely in awe of. Well, that's a very, very powerful thing to have done to you. And yes, I was enchanted. I was in love. You know, I, I, you know, the mantra I was given just went on for days and days and days. And I was pretty sure if I did my sadhana every day for at least two years, the bodhicitta would surely arise. And then I wouldn't have to make any more effort and I'd be able to sort of sail down the path benefiting all beings. <laughs> well, dream on. Um, <laughs> and I kind of, there was kind of prophetic moment immediately after the ordination. I went back to uh, number five Balmore Street where I was living, the infamous number five, to my little uh, cell-like room full of uh, reproductions of tankers of bodhisattvas, especially Padmasambhava. And Visantra somehow or other was able to share the room with me that night. He was lying on the floor next to me. And uh, in the depths of the night, from this uh, tanker of Padmasambhava on the copper-coloured mountain came this lightning bolt, this lightning bolt going straight to my chest, straight to my vitals. And I knew that if that hit me, I would die. I would die. And I wasn't ready for death at that point. And I can remember hauling myself out of this state and grabbing hold of Visantra. And I came to shaking him, saying, it's the picture, it's the picture. <laughs> Santa was a very patient Kalyana Mitra. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's great, I've had a weird experience. <laughs> Actually, I think it was a prophecy. It was a prophecy, it was a sign of how it would be, of how it would be. Uh, which I didn't heed, I think, because thereafter were many humiliations, many humiliations, many failures, many kind of breakdowns, much shame, much self-blame, totally appropriate, actually, much self-blame, much incomprehension, much loneliness. And I think I only began to get the hang of what I'd done about 14 years after all that. I would think, looking back, I really was like the proverbial Sufi moth to a flame. You know, just uh, skittering around this light, not realising that actually I was going to be completely consumed or a lamb to the slaughter. Beauty, enchantment, fascination, love, while well, love is the mother of death. Oh, but what if there were nothing to understand, nothing to learn? What if we had simply to accept incomprehension, accept defeat, accept collapse, disintegration, death, face dissolution of the mind, abdication of reason, erasure of what can be weighed, numbered, measured, sensed, known, Face descent into hell without hope of resurrection on the third day. Are we prepared for this? That's Banti in uh, On Glastonbury Tour. I think that's what spiritual death is really all about. And immediately after those lines in On Glastonbury Tour, Banti has these most beautiful and tender lines. Oh, I would lie down in the dark in the depths of the sea with my love. I would drift, red weed in green water, sway to and fro with the clock of the tides. So yes, love brings our destruction, but only so that we surrender more fully and completely to the boundless, shoreless ocean of love. And we will drift with its tides effortlessly and from this there emerges the greatest creativity so here's the last section i'll start winding up here we come to the flashing forth of the all maturing cosmogonic eros this is a phrase from lama govinda's book a living buddhism for the west 
and it's in the section on the guru-disciple communication, the guru-disciple relationship. And Sabuti, years and years ago, made me aware of this phrase. And he pointed out to me recently when we were talking about this area, we were talking quite a lot about Eros. He told me who made him aware of Lama Govinda's phrase. He said, well, it was Bhante. Bhante called Sabuti into his office and said, look at this. This is quite something for Lama Govinda to say, to describe the teacher as the flashing forth of the all-maturing cosmogonic Eros. And I was reminded of this phrase recently in conversation with Sabuti and some other order members on a small retreat at my squin. And we were, what we were there to do was to talk about what might happen at Adishtana in the future. What essentially is that place, that place is about, if you like. And really it was a kind of extended order meeting, very relaxed for a week. There weren't many of us. And we spent a lot of time talking. And actually we spent a lot of time talking about Bhante. In all sorts of ways, not, not necessarily straightforward ways, but particularly what Bhante has given us. And during various conversations, that phrase, the flashing forth of the all-maturing cosmogonic eros, came to mind. Uh, cosmogonic, of course, means creation of the cosmos. And I think it, this idea of the, of the cosmogonic eros comes from Gnosticism. Somebody might correct, correct me on that. But the cosmos, in, in some of these, 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 uh, these traditions, the cosmos is created by eros. It's created by love. Uh, chaos is, is turned into a cosmos out of love. When I think of what Bhante has done for me, it's that. His love of the Dhamma, love of us, has flashed forth, creating a cosmos in which we can mature and flourish. Certainly been my experience being with Bhante over the years. Okay, there's the wonderful clarity that I've received from him, that the education, my education has happened within our community because of Bhante. It's the knowledge, the culture, the breadth and depth of the Dharma. But within it all, or embracing it all, encompassing it all, or all that is the expression of a kind of energy, a kind of flashing forth of energy, an energy of love. And I'm not talking about romantic, sentimental love. I'm, I don't think I'm even talking about meta, as we usually understand it. I'm talking about something kind of electric, transforming, prophetic, and maturing. And yes, it is because it's love, because it's eros. It will be edgy. It will be dangerous. It will be wild. It will at sometimes press all our buttons. It might even be offensive. But what has happened through Bhante's teaching? He's created and recreated a world. And I, I feel that's what I've been introduced to in, in, in my practice from him, particularly to do with sadhana, actually. It's not, it's not a meditation. It's a showing of a world and an entry into a world. But of course, it's been more collective than that in so many ways. I mean, we were talking about some of the great lecture series that, that Bhante gave. We just were picking them out at that meeting, like the tantric series. That series is not about getting into the tantra. It's a particular aspect of Bhante's vision of the Dharma that he could only express in that way. It's a particular kind of quality of energy, I think, that that's all about. Or the Sutra of Golden Light series, Transformation of Self and World. Lokamitra says that that was an absolutely transformative lecture for him. That had a huge impact on him and led him to do the Dharma work in India. The Padma Sambhava Day 1979 lecture, that is, again, there's such an evocation of a, of a world being kind of talked into being, if you like, and what our centres, in a way, really need to be like. There's the Vimalakirti Nidesha series with its emphasis on building the Buddha land and so on. These aren't expositions of sutras, I think. Um, by a Buddhist teacher, they're visions of worlds. He's speaking, he's communicating Dharma worlds into existence. I saw it in India as well with the early lecture 
series in, uh, lecture, uh, talks he gave in India. He was talking, if you like, the movement into existence, inspiring us, firing us up. And of course, out of that, you get the transforming power of collective endeavour. And one of the things about, I think, Dante is his enormous faith in spiritual community and in the order's potential and a deep, deep faith in human beings, in you, uh, in me. And yes, in those lectures, those seminars, those individual communications, that's what you're getting. You're getting this all-maturing cosmogonic er eros flashing forth. And as I say, it's not always been easy. It can't be easy. It can't be tidy. It will be edgy. It will be challenging. Yes, it will be sensitive as well. And as I say, even offensive. I was very, very struck years ago reading George Steiner's book, The Lessons of the Masters, which is a kind of survey of the teacher-disciple relationship in the Western tradition. And he just makes the point, look, teaching is a seduction. Teaching is a seduction. Let's not pretend it's not anything other than that. You know, and let's not kind of make it safe. Yes, of course, there are ethics with that, but you are trying to convince somebody of your position. That's what you're doing. You are trying to draw people into a world. You are trying to evoke a world for them. And yes, there's, there's a deep faith that Vanti has. It's so often expressed, and you can hear it and miss it. A deep faith in human beings, in living beings, in the urge to transcendence, into their, a deep faith in their potential, a deep faith in the Bodhisattva principle. And out of all, all that, we have created worlds and environments ourselves. And we go on creating them, in which we can live the Dharma fully, completely, totally. Live from that deep urge to Buddhahood. And that flashing forth of the all-maturing cosmogonic eros needs to pervade everything we do in our individual communication, in our chapters, our spiritual friendships, our centre work, our artistic creation. It needs to pervade everything. It's that love in all its manifestations, in all its fascination, with all its danger that we must serve. And it needs to be alive especially between us. Without it, we're a dead order, a dead movement. We will embody collectively the spectre of Buddhism. And looking around, I see a tide, a kind of wave, a resurgence in our order, in our movement, uh, going around centres lately. There's some, many, and, and, and at Pabaloka, there are many incredible people coming to us hungry for the Dharma, and we need to meet them. Meet them fully and completely. Meet their energy, their creativity, their emergence. Yes, take them absolutely seriously. I've mentioned how Bhante and my Kalyana Mitras took me completely seriously. My aspiration was seen and witnessed. People took me more seriously than I took myself, which is frightening. Perhaps another great sin is not to take people's aspirations seriously. What's that uh, Bhante's rework of the, of the uh, first precept in the tantric version of the, of the five precepts? Do not obstruct the energy of any other person. Do not obstruct the energy of any other person. On the contrary, see that energy, meet that energy, love that necessary, that, love that uh, energy, and if necessary, get out of the way of that energy, so that it can get, so that the person can give it fuller expression, fuller transformative expression. So many people suffer because they cannot express, they cannot live from what is deepest, and that's the real suffering in this world. You get traditions where mystical traditions where they say that every creature is crying. Every creature is crying a secret hidden cry of metaphysical distress, of a kind of existential longing. They know their indigence. They know their poverty and they long for something greater. 
And perhaps it's even harder to hear that cry because of the noise of the modern world with the great increase in technology. But we need to hear that cry. And if the Dharma is to have a future in this world, we need to be people of love. The all-maturing cosmogonic eros needs to flash forth between us in the order. Our teacher has handed over to us. He's given his life to us, to the Dharma. So the teacher is now amongst us and within us and between us. But he or she or it will only be present if the all-maturing cosmogonic eros is flashing. Love awakens the teacher. I think that's an interesting discussion itself. People sometimes long for a teacher and a teaching. I would say learn to love. Learn to love, then you will find a teacher and a teaching. I'm going to end. Uh, I'd like to have rewritten this in Buddhist terms. It's a Sufi poem by a 20th century, 21st century Sufi master named Javad Nobaksh, and his name comes at the end of the poem. It's called The People of Loving Kindness. And I think it really describes what a spiritual community could be, should be, um, what we could be. One day I'll rewrite it in Buddhist terms. There's the word you in this at one point. It's a capital U. It's the ultimate. It's, let's think of it as the Buddha. We are the people of loving kindness, guides of one another through the purity of love's steps, all helpers of one another. Though embodied in different bodies, we are a single spirit, heart and soul, possessors of the hearts of one another. We are one people with no you and I, only we, all equals in love, all beloveds of one another. Only we may pass through the veil of the royal pavilion, all of us inextricably linked, all sympathisers with one another. Each of us is pledged in devotion to sacrifice ourself for the other, all candles and moths, all roses and rose gardens for one another. Our circle without doubt is a sanctum fostering affection, all of us drunk, then sober. From one another. The armies of the self have retreated from us, for we, for we are both each other's soldiers and commanders of one another. Our pain requires no physician or remedy. We are both each other's cure and the sickness of one another. If you call upon one here, all will say yes, for all have one name, one breath, all striving with one another. Our abode is a house of love for you, full of passion and music. We are melodies, reed pipes and lutes for one another. Onobaksh, it is from being free of any ego that we are so feverishly caught up in serving and dealing with one another. Thank you.